This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Combat Commander Europe. Combat Commander Europe was released in 2006 from GMT Games and designed by Chad Jensen. This is a two-player tactical war game that takes about one to three hours to play depending on the scenario you've chosen. First, let's take a look at the game objective and I'll show you how Combat Commander Europe works. As your nation's combat commander, you will issue orders to leaders, teams, and squads using fate cards. Each player has a deck of cards that they use to navigate their squads across the game map and capture objectives. Each side has a number of cards in their hand based on their strategic position in the game. Due to the nation's training and the current condition of their troops, each side will be able to conduct a set number of orders and actions per turn. The commander of each side activates units by placing orders. That order will then be executed by units on the playing board. In the case of the German player, they will try to defend objective points on the map. The American player will use his orders and actions to attempt to capture those objectives. Accomplishing these objectives will earn you victory points that will allow you to win the game against your opponent. First and foremost, Combat Commander is a game about infantry. Aircraft, armor, and other vehicles are peripheral to the experience. The focus of this game is the common soldier. And the first place to learn how to be a good combat commander and issue the right orders to your troops is at the officer school. So our next step is officer school. These are the fate decks. Combat Commander Europe has fate decks for Germany, Russia, and America. Each fate deck is composed of 72 cards, and each fate deck is tuned to that particular nation's strengths and weaknesses in World War II. The fate deck is the heart and soul of the Combat Commander game. It allows you to place orders, take actions, narrates events, and even replaces dice. In this section, we will learn how to use the Fate Deck. There are three key Fate Deck attributes that are outlined in each scenario in the Combat Commander playbook. For example, in Scenario 2, Hedgerows and Hand Grenades, the attribute of each player's Fate Deck is outlined here. The first attribute is Posture. Posture, quite simply, is the number of cards in your hand. Posture also indicates your tactical position in the scenario. There are three postures in Combat Commander Europe. Defend, which is a hand of four cards. Recon is a hand of five cards. And attack is a hand of six cards. The next attribute I call control. Control is the number of cards you can play as orders. In gameplay terms, this represents the quality and condition of your troops in the current scenario specifically the number of orders they can absorb and execute per turn. The final attribute is what I like to call Adaption. Adaption is the number of fate cards you can discard if you place no orders. Specifically, this is the flexibility of leadership to be able to adapt to situations on the battlefield. For our example, we're going to continue with Scenario 2, Hedgerows and Hand Grenades. 
In this scenario, the Americans are in an attack posture and have a hand of six cards. The quality and condition of the American troops allow them to take three orders per turn. And the American command structure allows them to discard up to five cards per turn. In this scenario, the Germans are in a defend posture. The quality of the German troops allow them to take four orders per turn. And the German command structure allows them to discard up to six cards per turn. Essentially, their entire hand. Now that we've talked about the hand management aspect of fate cards, let's look at the cards themselves. Regardless of nationality, each fate card is laid out exactly the same. In Combat Commander Europe, the fate cards serve a number of functions. The upper section of the fate card is controlled by the player. The lower section is controlled by the game when cards are drawn from the deck. First, let's look at the player-controlled sections of the Fate card. Don't worry about memorizing them now. We're going to look at them in greater detail in just a moment. The top section of the Fate card is for orders. There are eight distinct orders that can be given. The middle section of the Fate card is for actions. Actions can be played during a nation's turn or his opponent's turn. These are all the actions that may appear on the card and can be played. Next, let's look at the section controlled by the game. The bottom of the fate card is used for dice rolls and triggers. Triggers are interruptions in the game, such as jammed weapons, sniper attacks, and other events. If you draw a trigger called Event, then you refer to this section of the card. Events are random happenings that add challenge and narrative elements to the game. Now, let's step back and look at the player-controlled aspects of the card again. Each nation's Fate deck has a different number of these standard orders. Each nation's difference in the number of orders they have is subtle. However, they can give each nation a particular edge in certain aspects of the game. For example, Russia can place six advance orders, while America can only place four. America can place 20 fire orders, while Germany and Russia can only play 18. And America and Germany have more artillery quests than Russia. Next, we'll take a closer look at the orders. Orders can be classified into five groups. Movement cards, like move. Attack cards, like fire and advance. Morale-based order cards, like route and recover. Artillery cards, like artillery request and artillery denied. And... Foobar cards, like Command Confusion. If you get an order, or even an action, that says Command Confusion, it is a useless dud card. You'd better hope that the accompanying action is decent. Just like orders, each nation has a different number of actions that they can play. While with some actions, the number of cards is equal amongst nations, I've highlighted some areas in yellow where there are differences. The difference in the amount of cards is usually fairly minor. However, in some instances there are some big differences. For example, the Americans do not have the ability to place an action for a hidden pillbox, marksmanship, or no quarter. Marksmanship in particular is interesting because the only nation that has a marksmanship card is Germany. Another example is Command Confusion. America has two Command Confusion options, Germany has one, and Russia does not have any at all. It's important to keep these differences in mind as you play each nation in the game. 
Besides command confusion, the rest of actions can be organized into two categories. The first category is attack modifiers. The majority of the attack modifiers will give you a plus two based on the situation. The second category is defense modifiers. The majority of defense modifiers allow you to place obstacles. These defensive obstacles include foxholes, mines, pillboxes, wire, and smoke. Command Confusion operates just like its order counterpart. This is a dud card. Now we're going to run through a quick example of hand management mechanics. Let's bring everything we've learned so far together and see how it interacts with each other. It's the beginning of the American turn. They start with six cards. They start with six cards because they're in an attack posture according to the scenario. The quality and condition of their troops allow them to place three orders during their turn. The American can also play up to six actions during their turn or the German player's turn. The number of actions that can be played is determined by the number of cards you have in your hand at any one time. Before a player plays any orders, they have the option of initiating a pass. A pass allows a player to discard and replace a number of cards equal to their command limit. In this instance, if the American player decided to initiate a pass, they could discard up to five cards and replace them with new cards from the deck and then pass the initiative card to the German player without placing any orders. So let's say the American player doesn't like any of his cards and he's going to initiate a pass. He removes five cards from his hands and places them in the discard pile. He then draws five new cards from the draw deck. And that's how you initiate a pass. Okay, let's back the game up. The American player can place up to three orders and or up to six actions. Actions and orders are played from the same hand of cards. So if the American player plays his maximum of three orders, he or she has only three remaining cards to play as actions during the remainder of the turn. The strategy here is to carefully plan how many orders and how many actions you will be playing during your turn. As you play and resolve each order and action, you will move them to the discard pile. Once you've played your orders and actions, you're going to refill your hand up to the maximum draw amount. You now have a full hand of cards that will need to carry you through the German player's turn back to your turn again. Since orders and actions are printed on the same card, you need to make some tough choices to plan your strategy. If you cherry pick some good order cards, how many cards do you have left for actions to play until your turn comes around again? Remember, actions can be played during your turn as well as your opponent's turn. These mechanics are what makes the hand management aspect of Combat Commander so interesting. Finally for this section, let's cover off on the initiative card. When playing a pre-generated scenario, that scenario will indicate which side begins the game with the initiative card. A quick note, the initiative card is never part of a player's hand and therefore does not count against his hand size limit. The primary ability of an initiative card is the player that holds it can cancel all effects of the last die roll that have been made, including any die trigger associated with it, and then conduct a re-roll. So this ability comes with a little bit of risk. The initiative card can also be a tiebreaker. The initiative card determines the winner when a scenario ends in a tie. 
In other words, when the victory point marker is on zero. When this occurs, whoever holds the initiative card wins the game. Now it's time to take a look at the card aspects that are controlled by the game. Game-controlled aspects of the Fate card usually occur when a card is taken from the draw deck. Most of the time, this occurs when a dice roll is required. As you recall, dice rolls are also handled by the Fate deck. So let's say we peel off the top card of the draw deck and flip it over onto the discard pile. In a normal roll, you add the two dice results together. In a targeting roll, you multiply the two dice results together. If your dice result is surrounded by a red box, then this is called a trigger. There are four triggers that can occur in a dice roll. First, there's the time trigger. When a time trigger is rolled, then you will advance the marker on the time track and we'll cover off on that a little bit later in the video. Whenever a sniper trigger occurs, you're going to pause the game. The player rolling the sniper trigger reveals the top card of their draw pile, and ignoring everything else, reads aloud the random hex on that card. You can see the random hex on the lower left-hand side of every card. That player may then select one unit in or adjacent to that hex and break it. Next is the jammed trigger. Whenever a player makes a fire attack roll, and only during this situation, all firing weapons become broken. A quick note, this is just weapons, not radios or mines. And when an event trigger occurs, you will draw a new card from the fate deck and play out the event on that card. As far as events go, most of them are self-explanatory and play upon the rules we've learned in officer school as well as the rules we will learn in boot camp. Since many of the event effects impact the field, we will wait until boot camp to cover off on these in more detail. And our last class in officer school is learning how to operate the display track. The display track is the dashboard for monitoring the game's progress. From this display you can track the number of victory points that have been earned, the number of casualties sustained, the progress of the time track, as well as the objectives. The display track also operates as another player aid. Next, we're going to walk through the key areas of the display track. First, let's look at the victory track. The victory point marker starts at zero. To the left are victory points in favor of player A, which in this case we'll say are the Germans. To the right are victory points in favor of player B, in this case the Americans. Victory points are awarded for achieving objectives and unit elimination. When a unit is eliminated, the opposing team earns a certain number of victory points depending on the type of unit. Eliminating a squad is worth two victory points. Eliminating a team is worth one victory point. Leaders are also worth one victory point. Eliminating a leader also gives you plus one victory points for each point of command on its unbroken side. However, if you eliminate a hero, it's worth zero victory points. A quick note, eliminated equipment does not count for victory points. As victory points are earned, the victory point marker will get tugged back and forth on the victory track. At the end of the game, whichever side the victory marker is on wins the game. Since we just talked about unit elimination, let's move on to the casualty track. There are two casualty tracks on the display. One is for player A and one is for player B. Conceptually, they serve the same purpose, so let's just focus on one track for now. The casualty track is a mechanism that ends the scenario if too many casualties are incurred by either side. 
Each scenario will list a sudden death number to place the sudden death marker on the casualty track for each side. In scenario 2, hedgerows and hand grenades, the sudden death number is 8, so let's place the sudden death marker. As units are eliminated, you will place them on the casualty track. When enough units are placed to hit sudden death, that player loses the game. And like victory points, eliminated equipment does not count as a casualty. Now, let's take a look at the time track. The time track is another game ending mechanism. Each scenario will list a starting place for the time marker and the sudden death marker. For example, in hedgerows and hand grenades, the time marker starts at zero and the sudden death marker is placed at 7. Marker advancement occurs under two conditions. The first is if a fate card is drawn for a dice roll and there's a red trigger box around the dice that says time. The second is if the fate deck is depleted and then reshuffled from the draw pile to form a new fate deck. A quick note, in the rare occurrence that the last card drawn from the fate deck is the trigger card for time, then you only perform one marker advancement. As these two events occur, the time marker is advanced across the time track. When the time marker hits or moves past sudden death, then a sudden death roll needs to be made. A sudden death roll is made by drawing the top card off the face deck and adding together the two dice results at the bottom of the card. If the dice results are less than the current space the time marker is on, then the game is over. To be clear, that's the time marker and not the sudden death marker. If the dice results are greater than the number the current time marker is on, then you advance the time marker one more space. You will keep doing this until finally you fail the sudden death roll, which is probably 12. And that completes our officer school training for Combat Commander Europe. The next episode is Boot Camp, where we will switch from giving orders to following orders in the field. And that wraps up this edition of Harsh Rules. I'm Ben Harsh, and I thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.